This is the second in what will be a series of three videos about the Grand Theft Auto Trilogy, Definitive Edition for Nintendo Switch. My complicated feelings for this trilogy were laid bare with the previous video on GTA 3, but simply put, I like these, I like the originals too for different reasons, and in a super simplified way, the original release better reflects the artistic vision of the creators, and something was lost in the transition to Definitive, but more accessibility features and improvements to the core controls and gameplay are appreciated, and I don't want to dismiss them no matter how many funny compilation videos people put out. My footage of the trilogy was recorded in version 1.0.5, but version 1.0.6 is out and is a smoother experience with some small visual fixes, so what is on screen won't necessarily reflect what a person would see today, especially in regards to performance, and this also won't reflect some kind of hypothetical patch that may fix things even further. I'll talk about the game as it is now, and won't dismiss issues with it, but things are obviously subject to change the longer time passes from the moment of this video's release. And whenever I say anything good about this re-release, it doesn't mean I'm saying the original is bad, or I'm supporting this as the only means of playing this game. Rockstar might have punched me and stolen my food and then replaced it with different food, but that doesn't mean I'm not allowed to enjoy the new food, even if I don't like the situation itself. Okay cool, we got that out of the way, that way I don't have to repeat myself too much. Watch my previous video if you want a further breakdown about things like the controls or accessibility. We are now 20 years removed from the original release of Grand Theft Auto Vice City, a game that was a nostalgic throwback to a generation before my own, and itself is now a nostalgic relic of the bygone times I grew up in. I'd reminisce, but no, 2002 was a terrible time, and xenophobia had spiked, so let's get away from that by thinking of Vice City itself, a game set in the Reagan era where we start gang violence among the immigrant population of a city that is the center of the drug trade. <sighs> Much simpler times. Vice City is what the 1980s looked like to someone who wasn't alive then, but listened to 80s music and watched movies from that decade. I should know because I'm a part of that demographic, and I just won't accept how brown and boring the decade really was. This game is one part Goodfellas, two parts Miami Vice, three parts Scarface, and five parts of every best of the 1980s compilation album. If you like any popular music from the 1980s, you're sure to be pleased, and if not, you still have two talk radio stations, so I hope you don't mind hearing the same jokes over and over. Plus, there is Radio Espantoso, for less obvious picks that are equally as thematic to this diverse and colourful world. But I hope you like slightly less variety of music, because the Definitive Edition is missing some songs due to licensing issues. This will be a problem in San Andreas too. Personally, I don't like this, but record companies can be pains to work around, but the upside is most of the songs are still here, and for those who absolutely need every single song intact, the old version does still exist, or you can just mod this. The feeling is still intact here, even if not every single jam is accounted for, but you still do get that unmistakable Vice City flair. And it's worth remembering with today's cynicism and heavily marketed and capitalized 1980s nostalgia, which has been a huge part of the last two decades, Vice City was incredibly early on this bandwagon. It's a cliche now, but it really wasn't during the time of its release. If we separate Vice City from its many other sequels, it's easy to see that this is just a souped up version of GTA 3, which makes sense as this was originally developed to be an expansion to that. There are improvements from the last game, but this is the smallest jump in features and graphics between any two 3D GTA games released for the same system. Compare the list of features, vehicles, weapons, and things to do between GTA 5 and 4, or Vice City Stories and Liberty City Stories, or even San Andreas and Vice City. Then look at the comparison between Vice City and GTA 3. It drew the shortest straw here. It didn't really add much, but yet everything it does add is a series standard, and with very few exceptions, they wouldn't be missing from any of the sequels. So this is part of why GTA 3, when compared to its sequels, does look so weak. 
It was missing most of the staple features like motorcycles, buyable properties, and different clothing choices. And that's not even including the amount of weapons which GTA 3 looks like it's lacking in compared to Vice City and the many other sequels. You could say Vice City is just much more GTA 3, but it is a disservice to both Vice City and GTA 3 just to say this. So let's look at what Vice City actually is. It opens to Tommy Vassetti, a made man in the Ferrelli family in Liberty City, who has just been released from prison after his 15 year stint. It's now 1986, and to keep his recognisable face away from those who would remember him, and to help the Ferrelli family expand down south with the growing drug market, Tommy is sent to Vice City, Florida to participate in a drug deal which has already been organised. He just needs to deliver the money to the sellers, who are actually the Vance brothers, who for us in the real world are introduced here, but they were main characters of this game's prequel Vice City stories. However, as I'm sure everyone is aware, this deal goes horribly wrong, with only Tommy and one of the sellers, Lance Vance, making it out alive, and neither of them have the drugs or the money. It's now Tommy's job to recover this money and get revenge on whoever messed up the deal, as an angry Don is demanding that this be resolved. This premise will drive the early parts of the game, but it doesn't really take up later parts of the game because Tommy, with the help of his opulent mansion and the many legitimate businesses he acquires, becomes his own kingpin in Vice City. For a while, this is by far the fastest paced GTA game. Although depending on how you paste other content, this game can slow to a crawl later. The world is split into two main islands with some smaller islands in between them to help better segment things. Of the GTA games that make you play the story before getting full access to the map, this goes about it the quickest. Only the first handful of missions really leave Tommy stranded on this first island, and then the playground opens up incredibly quickly. Within a few hours, even at a casual pace but not a rampaging for dozens of hours pace, everything in the game will be available. But even after unlocking full access to the city, there is still one more carrot dangled in front of us, which is the ability to buy those businesses mentioned earlier, which become essential in the later half of this game's story. While I maintain GTA 3 as the most arcadey of 3D games, Vice City is by far the quickest paced, and playing all five 3D GTA games of this era so quickly together really reinforced this. And even with my current playthrough of GTA 5, which doesn't lock off any of the map, the opening of that game still does crawl to quite a slow pace. The dedication to this game being so quick and tightly focused leads to this being the only GTA game I ever feel compelled to do a sizable amount of side content in. This game has the perfect amount of it, and none of it feels superfluous. We don't have to go on dates to make our romantic partners happy, and there aren't any trips to the bar or bowling alley, nor is there any yoga. Instead we have the classics from GTA 3 like Vigilante and Ambulance, which have been improved with an actual end goal visibly in sight, as well as having more variety in the difficulty and tasks expected, and everything you get from this is a permanent buff like increased health, the ability to run forever, or to have taxis that can jump for some reason. And on that note, we have the best of these vehicle missions. You can deliver pizzas just by throwing them from a moving vehicle, which is way more fun than the other ignored food delivery vehicle in this game, ice cream, which is still quite fun as it's actually a front for delivering drugs, which the police are somehow not a big fan of. Even the worst of these vehicle missions feels incredibly fun here, and I don't dread doing them, I work them into my story because I just have so much fun doing it. Other GTA games usually have too much side content, and the quality ranges dramatically. And even in 3, which also had a good amount of it, it just wasn't as satisfying to do given the aimless feel and the city being less fun to navigate. Vice City's map feels perfectly designed for this. All the streets are memorable, shortcuts are everywhere, and while I do prefer settings with more hills and difficult terrain, this puts everything on an equal playing field, so you can cut across the map, and things like gravity or slow acceleration up an incline won't be an issue, just zoom past everything on this flat and narrow map with alleys everywhere. Much like the map, the missions themselves are simple and effective, and no two really feel alike. 
This is due to many things including the multiple objectives, the varied locations of a map. These are all more scripted as well, but not in the way that it feels like you have no freedom like you would in say GTA 5. Interior locations are also used, which allows this to feel much more memorable. We're introduced to a large variety of vehicles in missions as well, including the fact that we have multiple different aircrafts to use, both of the normal sized and the miniature toy variety. Tommy's voiceovers also make these missions feel less dull as we get his running commentary during certain sections, and buddies like Lance in certain missions further develop this. GTA 3 had a lot of repeating mission concepts and things that felt like filler. San Andreas will go on to dilute the overall mission quality with missions no one likes just because they wanted to introduce more concepts and mechanics, and this becomes much worse in the HD titles. Vice City is the perfect middle ground here. Every mission feels rewarding and most importantly, fun. The early missions here are the closest to being boring filler but they still set up the story or introduce new concepts such as using a golf club or hammer to kill people or damage a vehicle. And while these aren't the most fun tasks out there, these are things the player will be doing in some form or another across the whole game, and this is what players would expect from a Grand Theft Auto title. This isn't at odds with what people play these games for, but after the slightly slow but still comparatively fast introduction, the game's pace keeps increasing as mentioned earlier, and Vice City becomes the no-stops thrill ride GTA fans think every game is, before forgetting how tedious driving a tow truck across the city can be. For better and worse, this game is what detractors and frankly stuffy politicians of the time thought every violent game was, but that doesn't mean it isn't a fun time, just one that has no airs about what it is. The closest thing to class here is the all-star cast of characters, with leading man Ray Liotta giving us perhaps the most charismatic protagonist of the series, even if he's only a step above Claude in terms of depth. He's not deep, and I'd hate him in real life, but every second Tommy is on screen is a second my brain tells me he might be a bad guy, but I'm sure I could change him. And step one of that process is abandoning that shirt. It's not 1978 anymore. Tommy's range of clothes in this game is nice, and this is a wonderful addition to the series, but since this is the first time it was really in the series, it is also the worst execution of this concept. Later games, even the stories games that treated clothes as a single outfit and not individual pieces, still let you freely swap between all your outfits in a safe house. Here Tommy has to go to places where clothes are located, which is usually some kind of shop or tailor that is pointed out in a mission. It can lead to fun discoveries like the black shirt in the mall, or either of the tracksuits which aren't out in the open or given to you in a mission, but I'd rather just have some kind of wardrobe once I've unlocked an outfit. It makes changing clothes a tedious process, which I admit is very low on my list of complaints about this game I adore, but it's still on there. And let's rip this band-aid off now. The art style. Much like what I said in GTA 3, I do still like the look, but there are more caveats here than I had in 3 or will have for San Andreas. This at times can be the most jarring of the games in this trilogy, and it's mostly because of Tommy Vassetti himself. He got yassified the most out of this trio. This is the least accurate redesign in my opinion, and it does take some getting used to. I do still like it, just not wholeheartedly. The worst of it was the shock of seeing it for the first time, but the more you get exposed to it, the less it bothers you. His face doesn't really give me any problems. It's weird, but I kind of like it. But his arms, that's where I draw the line. Claude had no real arm issues because he basically had one look. CJ will have no arm issues because that game freely lets him run around in his underwear, and the game had to be built around that. But here in Vice City, they messed up the arms with all the different outfits you can use. His arms and hands just look wrong. The worst of these is the noodle arms that he gets with the Mr. Vassetti suit. This is the best suit in the game, but his arms are just so noodly. What happened to his elbow? His arms weren't meant to bend like that. It's freaking me out. If I ignore his arms and his hands, I have no real issues with his look. But even if we're just going by faces, Tommy, who I have warmed up on, was still given the worst treatment of the main characters, which is odd since you'd expect him to get more attention. 
everyone else frankly looks exactly as I'd expect or even want. The only other real change of note is just that Phil Cassidy isn't wearing the same top as before because over the last 20 years, the conversation about how messed up it is to display a symbol associated with a uh, state's rights, which means slavery, has reached the mainstream. People were furious at this so-called censorship, but they shut up once the release date version of the game showed up because there were much bigger issues. GTA 3 had a few characters who didn't quite get the full treatment when they were put through a pretty vacation machine, and they came out a little too uncanny or just kind of off. But here in Fire City, everyone who isn't Tommy looks good, as does the city here. GTA 3, especially pre 1.0.6 patch, looked very rough in a few places, but Vice City got the best treatment here. The neon lights do wonders to what could be a flat looking city, as does the sky, which is at its best when it's purple during the evening. Of the three settings in these games, Vice City received the most love, which is no real surprise, considering the scale they're working with and the strong identity of the original. My only real complaint here is the sand is sometimes a bit too high in the ocean, and the clear water is beautiful, but it does make the sand thing look even more apparent, and it does draw attention to just how lifeless all the sea creatures here are. The water on its own looks great, but it does draw attention to some of the deficiencies underneath. But when the ocean's faults aren't there, this water does look really nice and it adds to the atmosphere. It looks completely different to the water in GTA 3 or San Andreas and it gives it this warm and bright atmosphere even when you're drowning. Vice City unsurprisingly uses the water more than 3 ever did. It's really baked into the setting here, and the usage of boats is much more fun given the canals and multiple bridges incorporated here, which adds more challenge and easily distinguishable landmarks to what could have been an unmemorable blue blur like the water of Liberty City. Water is also flown over thanks to the helicopter and the seaplane that puts Three's dodo to shame, and the fact that Tommy, this guy who spent half his life in prison, goes from living out of a hotel to owning a mansion and flying helicopters on a regular basis in just a few weeks really emphasizes this game's lack of time smelling the flowers. It's all action all the time. This is more so the point in this remake, which lets you reload during a mission, which is especially appreciated in Vice City since getting busted or wasted defaults Tommy to the Hawaiian show which requires a drive for me to replace it to something more fashionable. Plus you have to rebuy weapons and ammo which is at least more fun here than in 3 considering the way shops work and the fact there is a larger variety of weapons to work with. I don't want to do that, just get me back into the action please. If I can help it I'll avoid all that and use the generous checkpoint system here except to deliberately fail a mission to get one of those indestructible cars like Diaz's. And for the car collectors, we have even more places to store them, thanks to this game's buyable properties which sometimes have garages. Even when they don't, they're still good places to manually save at, which to some is a pretty pointless feature here due to this remake's autosaves, but it doesn't feel right to stop the game without going to your actual safe house, but the point is you don't have to in case you need to get off in a hurry, or you just don't want to waste that time. To which I would say, it's not wasting time, enjoy the radio. I draw the line at redoing missions, not at going home. I don't want to buy all that ammo again because I'd rather save that money for buying properties. And these properties might be my favorite passive income in the entire series. And San Andreas had the same passive income system, and it was introduced so late that you could practically gamble at that time, which just meant that money once again became a pointless thing as you're gambling millions. Vice City stories kept vomiting up passive income, so much so that it became a joke. Here we get smaller amounts of daily income, and you have to drive to the business to collect them. The money hits a cap so you need to make regular stops instead of leaving the console on for hours to collect the giant amount. It may sound tedious, but it also gives money more weight and allows for side content like driving taxis to still have a monetary purpose. A passive income doesn't even become an option until you do missions for these purchased businesses, which shows Tommy taking the reins and interacting with the current staff. These are fun diversions which at first seem like some fun side content, but it becomes anything but. The main story missions do dry up at a point and the game won't progress any further until more of these property missions are completed, 
which is what I meant when I say the game can slow down later. And while these property missions are fun, they don't feel like a core part of the story, it just feels like things get put on hold for a bit, which is understandable considering the situation. Regardless of whether the game's ending is continuing with the uninterrupted, well-paced journey you set out, or it comes after an intolerable lull, it will frankly be the most exhilarating and sheer fun ending there is in this trilogy. Especially with the poorly implemented gyro controls, and I will not get off this hill. It's made even less awkward by the fact that Tommy can now crouch with a weapon, so he is slightly better than Claude when it comes to a gun. And after all that, you see the credits roll, and you'll only be left with two thoughts. One of which is, this game is just as fun now as it ever was, which is still a high bar for the era. And secondly, where are the women? We had two sex workers who were treated with the kind of respect you'd expect from the early 2000s. There was the leader of the Haitians who was barely in the game and she just hypnotizes Tommy to do things he wouldn't want to do. There is also the old lady who runs the ice cream van to sell drugs. And that's like it. This isn't Chinatown Wars where a woman is basically relegated to a marketing feature for the PSP release, but this is still a step down from GTA 3, which saw a few women in important roles including one who was the primary antagonist. Let's hope San Andreas has more women in it, and they're not just relegated to sex or something. Speaking of which, next time it'll be Grand Theft Auto San Andreas circa 1992, a game that decided to follow up such a fast paced thrill ride with one that dedicates the opening hours to learning mechanics like getting your hair cut, eating fast food, or being yelled at by your sibling for your muscle to fat ratio. But trust me, the game gets really good.